Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, uh, welcome to the final day of the conference. I'm delighted to see so many of you um, have stayed and uh, avoided that glorious beach out there uh, <laughs> to come and join us in the session today. Um, I'd like to quickly thank ACOM, who are my company, for supporting me. Um, also, the guys from Thunderhead for putting on such an incredible conference. Um, and very importantly, the Fire Safety Engineering Group at the University of Greenwich, where this work was undertaken. So again, my name's Aoife Hunt. I'm here to talk to you about uh, simulating hospital evacuation, so micro-simulation techniques uh, for hospital evacuation uh, modelling. Now, we've spoken a little bit about this already in the conference, and I've had some really productive conversations with many of you individually uh, yesterday and in the evening the day before. Um, but I am going to go through the background uh, again, even though Virginia covered lots of this in her amazing uh, talk yesterday. So by way of introduction... Um, there are approximately 1,800 hospital fires and in, in uh, hospitals, but also in healthcare uh, institutions in the UK. Now, that's just in the UK each year. This represents about 1 to 1.5% 1 of all building fires. So it's second only to dwellings. So in terms of public buildings, hospitals are number one in terms of fire incidents. And this trend is present in many other countries. So in America, for example, there's about 6,000, I think, a year. New Zealand, it's an equivalent proportion, about 1 to 1.5% 1 uh, of the fires that we experience every year. And of course, uh, hospitals contain large vulnerable populations that require continuing care. So the, uh, the focus of an evacuation isn't just to get people uh, out safely, it is to ensure that their ongoing safety and the ongoing treatment, uh, depending on why they're actually in a hospital. And of course, there are mobility impairments. So you have a larger proportion of people uh, that will require movement assistance. And so there'll be associated mobility equipment, but also associated medical equipment to take into account. So in this way, it's a very unique and very challenging environment. And there are other uh, challenges unique to hospitals. So firstly, the highly complicated spaces. In hospitals, you're likely to have uh, buildings that have had wings developed over time. They might be made of different materials. There might be wayfinding issues based on the routing between old and new parts of a building. Uh, with increasing urbanization, you're more likely to have high-rise hospitals, so hospitals with operating theatres on the 20th, 30th floor. And indeed, areas like operating theatres that have very, very unique challenges in terms of the kind of people uh, you'd be involved with and, and the safety measures there. But there are other issues, for example, uh, locked doors, so the security element uh, behind, you know, if you're looking after psychiatric patients or if you're uh, keeping medicines behind a closed door, you have a certain regime in hospitals of security which also impacts the flow of people through the building uh, in normal operations but in evacuation situations as well. And then in terms of fire, which I really won't go into because we're going to focus on evacuation, there are other challenges to do with the promotion of oxygen, for example, through the building and the very particular uh, electronic equipment that, that is there. So in terms of evacuation in hospitals, it's highly dependent on staff procedures which I guess sort of is intuitive to us all, but this is something that's very prevalent in uh, areas where there's some sort of social hierarchy. So if there's a school or military, for example, like in hospitals, if there's a normal hierarchy where you look to doctors or nurses or members of staff in, 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 as, as figures of authority, then you will wait for their instruction before evacuating. So we have found in studies of hospital evacuations that people will wait, even if they're able-bodied and can, and can evacuate themselves, they will wait for staff instruction before evacuating. So the onus really is on training staff to ensure that people uh, can get out okay. And of course, in healthcare environments, there's enormous staff turnover. There's very unpredictable levels uh, of staff in terms of repeatability in buildings. So you might have consultants moving between different sites, some people who are very aware of building procedures, some people who are new. And of course, this uh, yields issues with staff training. So while the focus is on staff and their role in an evacuation, it's very hard to keep them trained and up to date uh, in evacuation procedures. And of course, Unlike most buildings, unlike the offices we probably all work in, uh, which have regular, I hope, fire drills, hospital fire drills are very impractical. They're costly, they're unethical, um, and they may not really uh, work beyond helping the staff to develop their procedures because you don't have a stable population in a hospital like you do in an office. And finally, one of the, uh, one of the factors that's going to uh, impact all of our building planning is the upcoming demographic shift. So we have an ageing population, there's going to be more elderly people in all buildings, 
Uh, but certainly that will impact disproportionately, because of the, the nature of healthcare, will disproportionately impact uh, the numbers of people in hospitals. And other healthcare trends, for example, shifts to care in the community. So elderly patients who can be looked after at home are likely to be looked after at home, certainly in the UK and many other countries. And this means that people who are in hospital proportionally are sicker. They're more unwell than they would have been previously. Because if you're occupying a hospital bed, chances are you have very serious uh, issues in terms of mobility. So here are some of the uh, range of, of issues that we're dealing with with hospital evacuation. And the way that this is planned for is that hospital management themselves are responsible for the sole evacuation planning. Now, this varies between uh, regulatory requirements in different countries. Certainly in the UK, it's entirely the responsibility of the hospital management. They can't rely on the fire and rescue services in their plan. They have to demonstrate that using their own staff only, they can evacuate an entire building. And so a number of procedures are, are, are prescribed. So, for example, progressive horizontal evacuation is the one I'm sure we all deal with the most. This is the idea that you can move people progressively from compartment to compartment, so a fire-resistant compartment to a fire-resistant compartment, horizontally away from the danger until such time as which you can fight, fight the fire. And you do that in the order of those in danger, so people who are uh, in immediate danger first, regardless of any other attribute, followed by ambulant patients, so people who can self-evacuate. This would be um, Virginia's category A from yesterday. Uh, and then followed by non-ambulant patients, so patients who either need wheelchairs or beds or, or stretchers or other methods with which to get out. However, much post-incident analyses over the past few years, so for example, the Great Ormond Street fire in, in, in London in 2009 and the, uh, Great Mar uh, the Royal Marsden fire uh, in the same year, uh, they showed the need to plan for vertical evacuation in hospitals. So this idea that you can just move people progressively horizontally was actually found uh, to, to not uh, sufficiently uh, count for all the, the scenarios that you might have in a hospital. So... It's been highlighted that procedures might need to be revised to incorporate the vertical evacuation, so to incorporate using stairs and lifts in evacuation. Um, and of course, when we're looking at both horizontal and vertical evacuation, movement assistance is vital. It is the most important part uh, of a hospital evacuation, the means by which you can, take, you can assist people in their evacuation. However, the availability of movement devices, so the devices by which you might evacuate someone, and training in them hasn't been consistent or sufficient. And unlike wheelchairs, there are no, guide, there are no regulations for these kind of devices. So you might have an evacuation chair and a wheelchair. The wheelchair will have been, have been followed uh, uh, a specific set of, of guidelines as to what it should do and how fast it should go, uh, but the evacuation device wouldn't. So as part of this work... oh. I have a simulation slide. Um, this is a presentation meant for people who don't really know uh, what simulation is, but I assume most of you do. Um, so in a, will it play? To plan for evacuations in these kind of conditions where we can't run live drills, uh, when there's a, a high level of uncertainty, um, we run simulation models to try and predict uh, the time taken and, and, and the efficiency of various procedures. So, this is a, a Legion example up on the board. Sorry, uh, Pathfinder. But there's many, many other examples <laughs> of microsim. So, when we're looking at the tools that are available to us, so the existing micro simulation models, and we're looking at the problem at hand, so hospital evacuation, we have to ask, well, what's missing? So, we can model individual people moving around a structure. We can model, uh, to a degree, uh, levels of density and people evacuating uh, from buildings. <laughs> But when we're looking at hospital evacuation, we need to find out some more information. So we need to know, again, as identified in the talk yesterday, the time required for various procedures. How long does it take uh, to uh, prepare patients? How long does it take to move them? Also, the physical impact of repeated patient collection. Again, if your hospital is entirely responsible for the repeated collection of the patients, uh, what toll will that take on your staff and how many staff members do you need? So while simulation models can provide some insight, and uh, like the work Virginia did in STEPS uh, and in Pathfinder, and we did uh, some in Exodus, they currently don't efficiently uh, represent the assisted evacuation of PRM. And I think we're getting a talk later about a development which actually should, should uh, uh, make this statement redundant, and I'm delighted if that's the, if that's the case. 
Um, really importantly, um, analysis is needed uh, to substantiate the current ideas about uh, the order in which we evacuate patients, because these are, are based on precedent as opposed to based on evidence. And finally, you know, there's a need to model assisted evacuation, not just for hospitals. The title of this talk is Simulating Hospital Evacuation, but actually for all buildings with people with reduced mobility, PRM. Um, there is a need to, to be able to model their safe evacuation too. So the objectives of my work was, was to identify, as I have done in the past few flies, some of the issues that influence the outcome of hospital evacuation and what factors matter. Um, I looked at the sort of data and modeling requirements that were necessary, and I focused in on movement devices. So this really crucial issue of how do we use uh, various movement devices to evacuate people who are unable to evacuate themselves. So how do different movement devices perform in the vertical and horizontal evacuation of people with reduced mobility? How can we collect data on this? How can we use this data to compare the performance of devices? And then finally, how can it be explicitly modeled uh, within some of these microsim models? So that's basically uh, the structure of the work, and I'm going to whiz through it uh, today. So the data collection element uh, took place in 2008 at uh, the University of uh, Ghent Hospital. We tested four movement devices, as you can see uh, up on the screen here. So we have a stretcher, which is operated by four people. It's a, a, a a metal frame that's carried in each corner by either four uh, male operators or four female operators. We have the evacuation chair. So this is one you might have seen in the corner of stairwells and such. Um, this is a, a purpose-built evacuation chair, which is wheeled like a wheelchair on the horizontal. And then when you go down the stairs, it's like a skiing motion where you're, you're holding back uh, against the resistance of the weight. So this is a purpose-made uh, evacuation chair that can be operated by one person. Then we have the rescue sheet. Now, this is the most commonly used movement device in a hospital. It's a set of straps under a bed. And the idea is that uh, in the event of, of an emergency, you bundle your patient up in their bed. All associated medical equipment, if appropriate, goes in with them. Uh, and they are tied up in the straps, and then they are dragged uh, down the corridor and down the stairs in this uh, rescue sheet. So it's a very, very quick and efficient way of, of, of doing it, actually. And this requires two people. It's very manually taxing, in, in fact, dragging, dragging this thing along. And then finally, the carry chair, which is like the stretcher, but in a seated position. So you have uh, four handles on the carry chair, and you can wheel it on the horizontal, and then you carry it on the vertical. Now, for the purpose of safety, we had uh, four female operators using the carry chair and three male operators. It was decided that it would be too heavy to have uh, just three female operators, but we wanted to look at the difference between the handling techniques between three people and four people. So that's why we have slight difference here in gender. So we investigated the time taken to fulfill different procedures, the impact of repeated collection. We ran 32 different trials, testing the four devices over two days. And we ran it in an 11-story hospital, so mid-rise hospital. This is really important. The device handlers were expert manual handlers. So the results of this study really represents the best case scenario. So if you have your highest trained members of staff who've been doing it for years, this is the absolute best performance you can expect from these devices. And of course, in reality, you can scale that down by a safety factor as appropriate. Uh, we had two people pretending to be people with reduced mobility, PRM. So um, we didn't use real patients in this, don't, don't worry. And we had four teams of participants. So we had two male teams and two female teams. We didn't want a sample of just one. A sample of two isn't enormously better, but it is certainly uh, more comparative. So here are the phases that we looked at in data collection. So the first one is preparation. So the time taken to pick up a device, take it to a patient, transfer them from a wheelchair, for example, and then uh, leave the room in the experiment. So the time taken to prepare that person. Now, because we weren't adding on any time for medical uh, needs, this obviously needs to be taken into account. So again, this is the absolute best performance you can expect. If someone needs nothing else apart from lifting into the device, this is the speed that will be attained. Then we have the horizontal speed. So we have the time taken to go down flat portions of a corridor, right angle turns in a corridor. So this is a standard uh, hospital corridor. Uh, the time taken to open doors and shut them behind you. So again, if you're moving from fire-resistant compartment to fire-resistant compartment, one of the, the issues will be, while carrying the devices, to make sure that the doors are open and shut. So we tracked all of this movement in the hospital, 
And then in, on, on the vertical, through 11 story uh, dog leg staircases, so that's 22 sub staircases, so each one had a main landing and a, and a sub landing. We tracked the time taken to go through each floor. The time taken to go around two dimension, two different dimensioned uh, landings, and also the time taken when rested. Now, Enrico was talking yesterday about the uh, impacts of, of fatigue, and actually, it's not just looking at things like speed reductions, it's looking at the times where people stop and take a break. And we found that there were many occurrences in the trials where people would stop, and this is my, my little diagram, which isn't very, <laughs> isn't very good, but it is... Uh, it does indicate the time where people might have ha felt that their arm was sore and so they swapped with the person in front of them to pick it up with the, with the other arm. You know, this was a long journey uh, for them. So it was 11 storeys by vertical stairway, 60 metres in the horizontal and the hospital rooms and dimensions were pretty, pretty standard. Here's an example of, of the footage. So here we have a stretcher and we have, that's Professor Ed Gallia there in the corner, I wanted to give him a shout out for the video. Um, uh, so here we have a patient uh, being prepared into the stretcher device. So as you can see, there are very specific guidelines as to where to place these on the floor. So we made sure that the, uh, the experiments were, uh, were consistent with each other. And we have two people picking up the, uh, the, the patient, and then they're going to be secured in the device. If I zoom along, because I want to save a bit of time, we have... Uh, the corridor portion, so they've just gone through the doors here and they're heading towards the stairway, um, and then the stair portion. So the video that you're seeing then was the roaming camera. We had 13 different cameras, so we had... <laughs> We had uh, roaming cameras following the device on its journey the whole way through the structure, but at every floor we had uh, fixed cameras looking at it. So they were filmed from every angle uh, for, their whole, uh, for the whole duration. And then I had the wonderful job of spending a year uh, conducting the data analysis. Here's the difference between the view of the roaming camera and the, uh, the secure camera up there. And I think we have another device here. <laughs> so this is the mattress. And then here we have the, uh, the vacuum chair. So there's a paper on there. So if anyone's interested in looking at the, the results of this study in full, you can, you, can, you can find the paper online. So I'm going to go very briefly through the results, but again, you can, you can look more into this. Um, so uh, here's just a very quick summary. We looked at a number of different factors. Uh, but in terms of the, the categories I mentioned before, preparation time, horizontal time, and stair descent speed, um, here are basically uh, the, the performance factors. Um, green is good and red is bad here. So here we have preparation time. So the, the highest performing device was the evac chair. So it took about 30 seconds to pick someone, take someone out of a, um, a wheelchair and place them into uh, an evac chair, and including all secure uh, strapping. And then the stretcher took uh, the longest time. Um, as expected, because we were looking at the differences between uh, male and female performance to try and get a, a range in terms of physical capability, as expected, in the more manual handling tasks, uh, the female teams uh, took, took slightly longer. Um, on the horizontal, this isn't surprising either. So in green, we have the performance of the chairs. So on the horizontal, the evac chair and the carry chair were... Um, were much more efficient because they're not being carried, they're being wheeled. And then the rescue sheet and the stretcher, which were being physically carried, uh, ended up performing uh, slightly uh, uh, less. So the, um, the wheeled devices are comparable to fast walking speed, actually. So we normally consider fast walking speed about 1.5 meters per second, and that's a sort of through and standard. Um, so the chairs were moving at a, at, a, at a fast speed, and then the other devices, uh, obviously on the horizontal, were a bit slower. Now, the stair descent speed, I've just averaged this. So this is a really broad result. Um, but again, we have the evac chair and the rescue sheet um, are the quickest, so at 0.8 meters per second. But that's only the rescue sheet if, if it's been operated by male handlers. So there's a big dip in performance there um, when it's the female teams. And then the carry chair and the stretcher uh, came out as the slowest, which again is to be expected as they're being physically carried down the stairs. <coughs> Now, the most important finding, I think, of the data is here. Is that my laser? I'm so close to it, I could just point. Here. <laughs> Where we see very little difference in the performance between male teams and female teams using the evacuation chairs. Now, these evacuation chair manufacturers have always said that um, it's not very physically demanding 
<clears throat> skiing people down the stairs. And actually, this is good evidence that they're, they're, they're right in this case. So the female teams that had taken longer in physical tasks in different aspects uh, then took an equivalent length of time as, as the men when they were using the evacuation chairs. So that's a really important finding. As I mentioned, the time that the, uh, that the, the, the device team stopped to take a break in the stairwell was very telling of whether or not they, they were fatigued. And here we have, so it's quite hard to understand, I appreciate, but these uh, squares and triangles are the positions where the teams had stopped on the stairwell. So we have floor 11 down to floor 1. And here are all the stops for the stretcher. There were no stops for the evacuation chair, loads of stops for the carry chair, and then only a few for the mattress. So, um, again, a really interesting finding of this study is that we expected broadly these lines to go down. So after you've been carrying someone for one, two, three, four, five minutes, or down 10, 11 flights of stairs, that people might get slower. But we actually found a slight increase. Now, in terms of statistical significance, there is no significance in the increase. It's essentially no fatigue. There is no... Um, it's a flat line, basically, statistically. We would love to continue this. Um, I don't know if we get ethics approval to do 100 floors, but it would be fantastic to see whether or not these curves change over time and whether or not there's a psychological effect of people knowing that they're nearing the end and speeding up. That would be a very interesting further study. I'm going to zoom past this because we won't get, to the, uh, won't get to the modeling. If you're interested in the data, do check it out online. So we conducted a performance comparison. And so when I'm showing these results, um, the reason why we split it into these different phases is that different devices perform better under different conditions. So we came up with a performance matrix. So if you're looking to uh, quantify the performance of devices on various terrains, then please do uh, read this and, and look at the matrix. What it allows you to do is to take into account the kind of structure that you have. So if you have a structure that's only got one floor, but a lot of horizontal uh, movement, you might look at one of the chairs because that's going to be quicker. But if you have a very high-rise building, you might want to look at something that's going to work well on the stairs. So there is no winner in terms of the best device. It is very much to do with the, uh, the, the requirements of individual uh, buildings. So we compared, we used the data to compare the performance of the device, but we also used it to implicitly model in uh, building exodus. And by implicitly model, it's doing basically what Virginia did with steps and Pathfinder. We used the data, we used group behaviors in the microsim models, um, and we used interim destination points to represent groups coming together, picking up a patient, delaying for the preparation time, traveling at the horizontal speed that we noted, on the horizontal, going through the doors with that delay, and then going down the stairs at that speed as well. And this was great. And again, it came out with some, some good results um, and some solid uh, verification for the techniques, uh, as long as you only have one device. But the problem with using uh, re the reduction of speeds and changing the shapes of microSIM agents to replicate devices is that you're not taking into account the size of the device. So you can take into account the time taken for individuals, but actually, as we know, the, the value of microSIM models is the interactive behavior and the emergent behavior. So if you can't replicate the actual size and the shape of the device going down uh, a corridor and down the stairs, then you can't capture fully the emergent conditions that will happen when you've got a number of different patients. And of course, that's the end goal in this, is to be able to model a full hospital. So while many models were able to model the reduction in speed, there were none currently that could model the, uh, the evacuation devices themselves. Now, obviously, incorporating large objects into evac models is very challenging. As I'm sure the Thunderhead guys are going to agree. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you about what I did in building Exodus in terms of the, uh, the, the, the theoretical development, but I'm sure we'll hear more about, about their take on it. Um, so the first thing uh, to look at uh, when, we, when we're looking at the theoretical uh, uh, application of trying to develop our, our models to include rectangles and shapes moving around corners is to look at the geometric decomposition. So Exodus that I was working with was based on a nodal system. So you have a set of nodes and arcs, and many models are, are, are based on this, or, or rather a continuous version. And either way, you need to be able to assess whether or not a, something that's bigger than a person is going to be able to fit on a continuous plane. 
So I used something called a generalised Voronoi diagram. And this is where I should warn you all that I used to be a maths lecturer. But I'm not going to go too much into the maths. I'm just going to point to equations and move quickly on. Um, so a Voronoi diagram looks at a set of the loci of, 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 of the the distance between two points. So you're trying to find the maximum distance between any two points in a, in a geometry, and that will give you a central path. So an image will say it all. So we created an automated program that could scan a geometry and find what's called the uh, generalized Vion, Di, Vion, Voronoi diagram as a loci of, of consecutive maxima. So here we have the central line going through all of these geometries. Now this isn't to say that a device will use a central path, it's a way of understanding the geometry and, and, and learning about whether the route itself, whether or not the route has turns, whether or not the route turns back on itself, the various angles, and really importantly, the width in terms of dimensions. So what we can do by scanning geometries in this way is identify areas on the routes where you might encounter a corner. And these are the areas where you want to check whether or not your device can fit. To check whether or not a device can fit in a corridor is very easy because you're just looking at the width and the width of the corridor. When you're looking at corners and more complicated structures, it's a lot more difficult. So using the Voronoi diagram, we can automatically detect corridors in a route. So you can scan a CAD diagram or another diagram, and you can say between these paths, uh, these are the numbers of corners and the, the angles that you will go. And then you can run some simple maths to say whether or not devices of different dimensions uh, can fit around that corner. So that was step one. Uh, secondly, we used movement algorithms based on the potential maps of the uh, nodal system. So many of you will know that uh, for wayfinding in many models, building exodus included, there's something called a potential map where occupants look at every step around them and they choose the step with the best relative utility. So which is going to give me the value that's closest to either an exit or my next location? So it could be a refuge uh, or, or towards a door. So in this way, the devices were acting like large rectangular agents. So they were thinking, uh, right, where's my next step? Where's the best position for me uh, to be in? And then they were turning towards the path of least uh, resistance using the potential map as well. So this is a way of using the existing navigation techniques in order to make sure that your devices can also navigate on the same grid. So on the same nodal uh, grid as the agents, devices could also navigate and be present. And in terms of how they occupied the space, there was a radial function here, which just said, if you're this proportion into a node, then you're on the node. And this is very useful because depending on what kind of device you have, you might want to have uh, the ability for an agent to stand very close to that device or far away from that device. A good example would be a hospital bed. So a hospital bed, if you're walking next to it, you might walk right next to it with your hip next to it like this but you wouldn't walk that close to it if you were in front. So having this radial function can give us an idea of whether or not you're going to allow an agent to stand right next to or in front of each device by limiting the availability of the agents around you. We also came up with algorithms to uh, specify the stair movement. So we noticed that the devices traveled largely in lanes on the stairwell, depending on whether or not they used handrails. So here we have on the outer lane, we have the mattress was using the outer lane. The stretcher was very much in the middle, as you all saw. The evac chair, as you saw again, was hugging the inside. So we just specified paths for the lane usage of devices based on their dimensions, based on the dimensions of the landings. And again, here's an equation I'm going to point to and not explain. Um, how am I doing for time, Brian? Close to the end. Okay, I'm going to speed up. So we attached, <laughs> we, we attached uh, attachment points to the devices to replicate the inter-device uh, uh, interaction so that people could come, pick up the agents at their attachment points, take them off, and then we applied a specific speed to represent them going through that door. So they slowed down based on the length of the device, which was the most uh, efficient way of modeling this. Uh, they slowed down appropriately. Um, we also incorporated the stair movement algorithms. So as well as traveling in lanes, they traveled at the appropriate speed. And we explicitly modeled the time in which they stopped in the experiment. Now, this is really important because that's the time uh, in which people overtook the device. 
So we had a group of people in our second device trials who were trying to evacuate alongside the device, and we found that when devices stuck to their lanes and they gave people room, that they did choose to evacuate alongside them. So that was replicated in the uh, vertical speeds. And I can't show you the video because we're running out of time. So finally, <laughs> um, a battery of tests were, were done at the end of this work. Uh, so we followed the uh, NIST and IMO uh, testing procedures, and then we added a ton of our own. And so we found uh, that uh, we could verify against, um, against the functionality that we expected, but also against the data that we collected. And we found that uh, the explicit representation, so this work was an improvement on the implicit representation. It could block people in situations when other where, where the implicit uh, model did not uh, have that ability. So finally, you know, the, the cases that we run demonstrated that we have new forecasting ability. So we can now test evacuation procedures uh, and quantify the impact of having multiple devices on the horizontal and in the stair. And this gives us uh, the ability to gain some new insight and it can support risk assessments and evidence-based analysis in the future. Um, it means we can create bespoke models based on individual plans, um, but also represent both normal and emergency operating uh, um, uh, procedures. So we can uh, investigate safety factors, but we can also look at the normal operation of, of hospitals now that we can model the actual movement of beds, medical equipment, etc. I'm going to zoom to the end. So finally, uh, the data that we have is a great start. As I said uh, at the beginning, it really does represent the best case scenario. So we need more data based on um, more realistic uh, expectations of normal staff, you know, not expert manual handlers uh, being able to use these devices. We want to look at handler fatigue, so it'd be great to extend it to see if people do slow down. Do they um, uh, stop more often, for example? Uh, to look at different medical and preparation requirements, so to look at really specific environments like operating theatres. But also to look at the physical performance. So there were some interesting findings there between the male and female teams. What if you had a mix of men and women uh, uh, carrying together? That's a really interesting problem because some may compensate, some may, some may not. So to look at the performance of, of teams there in the mid-ground. And also the impact of training. So uh, if you're an expert manual handler, great. But if you've only seen a video on how to do this once, how does that impact your speeds and your performance? So finally, we're going to continue this uh, uh, model development and we're going to extend it because having this generic object model is really useful for other environments. So essentially, we can now replicate things bigger than people evacuating alongside people. So that means we can represent bags, prams, trolleys, vehicles, police horses. It's my favorite application, I think, <laughs> in, uh, in crowd control. So we can now replicate uh, the conditions where we have people larger, sorry, objects larger than people evacuating alongside people. So sorry for rushing there at the end, and uh, please do let me know if you have any questions, and do email me if you walk away and think, ah, oh, I wish I'd asked that. Thank you. So, uh, questions? Yes. So, if <clears throat> thank you for your really nice presentation. Uh, what I found out is that hospitals uh, love those uh, rescue sheets instead of the evacuation chairs because uh, roughly you can buy uh, between five and eight rescue sheets uh, instead of one evacuation chair. And then there's another problem. When you uh, rescued one person with the rescue chair, uh, where are you going to put it? On, uh, will you put the person on the floor? So you need a device where to, to put this person on. If you rescue them with their own mattress, they are already on their mattress. So you can leave them anywhere in the building or outside of the building. But with, uh, we did also some of those experiments. And uh, what uh, was really astonishing for me is this rescue sheet doesn't cover the mattress completely. So it depends on the material of the mattress, what speed you are going to achieve. And there is some kind of mattresses where you can, can't basically walk because they like stick to the ground. So it depends on what kind of, uh, of, of flooring you have uh, to what kind of mattress you have. Um, we didn't take this into account before 
never because uh, we weren't aware of, uh, of those problems. So uh, there has to be a, more or less like a, a link between uh, fire safety engineering and our simulation and the operating, uh, operating hospitals because uh, when they buy their mattresses, they are not aware of the problem that they might track them later <clears throat> through the floor. Thank you. That's some really uh, uh, excellent comments there. Um, firstly, in, in terms of cost, so one of the reasons that we developed that uh, performance matrix is because based on your priorities, you might be looking for one device, ten devices, and you can uh, put cost in as a factor there. So, of course, uh, the reason that uh, rescue sheets are so, so used in hospitals is because they're, they're a lot cheaper and they can achieve equivalent speeds. But if you're Choosing a device for a cinema, for example, you might choose to have the one chair. So you're absolutely right. Cost is an enormous factor here. We have found, you're right, there's, there's many issues with the, the, the different types of rescue sheets. And actually, many hospitals are opting not to use them for hygiene reasons. So you're basically having the same set of straps under a bed, regardless of, of, of what's happened um, oh, since the duration of, of those straps being there. So there are many, um, there are many issues to, to think about when looking at that. But certainly, in the cases where you can't drag it because of the material, um, more data are required to see what it's like carrying it. And I suspect the speeds would be more similar to the stretcher because it would be involving that physical carrying. But I'll be interested to hear more about your work. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. Okay, thanks, guys.